Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and you can think of me as your friendly guide to the English language. Writing, history, rules, and cool stuff. Today, I respond to a listener question about when to capitalize Google, and I have a meaty middle about why we call the score of zero in tennis love. If Google executives care about their trademark, they'd like you to not use Google as a verb, since doing so threatens that trademark. But as you know, it's very common to hear people say, I googled it, to mean they searched for something on Google. AP style is to capitalize Google when you use it as a verb, when you say you googled something or you are googling something. The Chicago Manual of Style also says to capitalize trademarks such as Google, but notes that although this is what corporations would prefer, it's not a legally binding rule. And they note that Webster's includes lowercase entries for both Google and another company name that's become a verb, Xerox. The Merriam-Webster Online Dictionary lists the verb Google as lowercase, but notes that it's often capitalized. The Oxford English Dictionary entry shows the verb Google capitalized, but says it also can be lowercase. And Gardner's Modern English Usage says it can go either way, but that it's more common to keep Google capitalized than to write it lowercase. The bottom line is that you don't have to capitalize it unless you're following AP or Chicago style, but it's probably a good idea to do it anyway. And no matter what you decide, pick one way of doing it and be consistent instead of flipping back and forth between two styles. Be deliberate. Finally, remember how I said at the beginning that Google executives wouldn't want you to use Google as a verb if they care about their trademark? Well, maybe they don't care, because a couple of years ago, Nancy Friedman, a corporate naming expert who goes by Frida Nancy on Twitter— found an ad for Chromebook computers that deliberately uses the product name Chromebook as a verb. It read, if you're over the old way of doing things, you Chromebook. And in case you're curious, they did capitalize Chromebook. So that's your quick and dirty tip. It's common to use certain company or product names as verbs. And when you do, it's usually better to capitalize them. Before we get to strange tennis terms, today we're sponsored by Blinkist. If you're like me, you have a never-ending list of books you want to read, and not nearly enough time to read them all. Fortunately, Blinkist solves that problem once and for all. Blinkist is the only app that takes thousands of best-selling nonfiction books and distills them down to their most impactful elements. So you can read or listen to them and expand your knowledge in just 15 minutes from anywhere, all on your phone. I listen to Blinkist when I'm on the treadmill, and I'm no exercise junkie, but you can fit in a blink even in the shortest workout or walk. Have you wanted to feel culturally literate about Becoming by Michelle Obama, The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss, or Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari, one of my favorites? Well, now you can with Blinkist. And right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for my audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash grammar to start your free seven-day trial. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash grammar to start your free seven-day trial. Blinkist.com slash grammar. It's almost July, and that means it's time for Wimbledon, the most widely watched tennis tournament in the world. It's played on the grassy courts of the All England Lawn Tennis and Croquet Club, just southwest of London. The first Wimbledon championships were held in 1877. They featured a field of 22 men who were advised to bring their own rackets and to wear, quote, shoes without heels, unquote. The balls were hand-sewn with a flannel casing. The rackets were made of wood and looked distinctly like snowshoes. The event was so successful that a women's championship was added seven years later. First prize for the ladies was a silver flower basket valued at 20 guineas. Fast forward about 100 years. In 2018, the winner of the women's tournament, Angelique Kerber, took home 2.25 million pounds. That's about 2.8 million U.S. dollars. Her racket was made of a carbon graphite compound, originally developed for use in space flight, and the balls she played with had to match international standards dictating their mass, 
size, deformation, and rebound. In other words, things have changed. One thing that hasn't changed, though, is the weird scoring system used in tennis. Let's start with love, the word that means zero in tennis. When a match starts, the score is 0-0. Zero, zero. In the tennis world, that's called love all. There are a couple theories on why. One is that the number zero has an oval shape, just like an egg. The French word for egg is loaf. Say loaf five times fast, and it starts to sound like love. Loaf, 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 loaf. <laughs> Seems like a bit of a stretch until you consider the fact that we also call zero on a scoreboard a goose egg. Sports fans have been saying this since at least 1867, about the time the first tennis matches were being played. Another theory is related to the expression to play a sport for love as opposed to playing for money. This refers to the practice of playing a competitive game simply for the fun of it, not because you might win a prize. In other words, just for the love of game, you'd accept a score of love and keep on playing. This explanation is suggested, but not verified, by the Oxford English Dictionary. The OED also notes that love has been used for centuries to mean zero in other games, such as bridge and whist, the card game from which bridge is derived. So, in tennis, love means zero. What's also odd is that instead of counting points as 1, 2, 3, 4 in tennis, you count them as 15, 30, 40 in game. In other words, winning a fourth point wins you the game, provided you've won by two points. So why does tennis do this? It's because tennis is based on a much earlier game known as jeu de pume, meaning game of palms. It got this name because players used their hands rather than rackets to bat a ball back and forth. In this game, courts were 90 feet long, with 45 feet on either side of the net. When a player won a point, they got to move up 15 feet and start the next point from there. If they won another point, they could move up another 15 feet. But if they won a third point, they couldn't move up 15 more feet or they'd be sitting right on top of the net. So this theory goes, they would move up another 10 feet. Thus, their progression forward would be to 15 feet, then 30 feet, then 40 feet, which corresponds to the 15-30-40 scoring method we use in tennis today. The second theory is that tennis's scoring system is based on the movement of hands around a clock, with the quarter hours 15, 30, and 45 being progress points in winning the game. This theory is a little shaky because the third point in a tennis game isn't called 45, it's called 40. But this theory goes maybe it took too long for players to say 45, so over time it was shortened to 40. Once again, this seems like a bit of a stretch. However, consider the fact that amateur tennis players often shorten 15 to 5 when calling out their scores purely because it's easier to say. So it's not unreasonable that the same thing happened with 45. It was eventually shortened to 40. As strange as tennis scoring is, at least the sport didn't retain the very strange name it was almost given. Sferistike. That's what the originator of modern tennis, one Major Walter Clopton Wingfield, called it back in 1873. And why not? In Greek, sferistike means skill in playing at ball. The Major's friends loved his game, but suggested a simpler name, lawn tennis. And fortunately, that's the name that stuck around until today. That segment was written by Samantha Enslin, who runs Dragonfly Editorial. You can find her at dragonflyeditorial.com or on Twitter as Dragonfly Edit. Finally, I have a Familect story. This one made me laugh. Hi, Mignon. I'm Dave from Michigan. And I have a Familex story that comes complete with sound effects. When uh, my children were little, we would occasionally take them out to a restaurant for dinner. And as is often the case, they wouldn't finish all of their meal. So I got into the habit of eating some or all of the leftovers on their plate. We called this seagulling after the birds that we'd see picking at food at the beach. We would ask, are you going to seagull that before we go? Or... Hey, no seagulling. I'm not done yet. We even shorthanded it to make the sound of a seagull. We, we would just say, meow, meow, meow. 
as we swooped in for those last few fries, I don't recommend seagulling as I think it contributes to getting a dad bod. Thanks, Minyan. I'm a huge fan of your books and podcast. Bye. Thanks, Dave. If you want to tell me a story about a word that your family made up and uses, you can leave a voicemail at 833214-GIRL, and I might play it on the show. I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. Did you know that Grammar Girl is part of the Quick and Dirty Tips podcast network, which I founded and which has a bunch of other shows? You can make your life better by listening to the Get Fit Guy, the Mighty Mommy, Everyday Einstein, who talks about science, and a whole bunch more. Check them out wherever you listen to podcasts. That's all. Thanks for listening. 